Hello, everyone. Welcome to New Hope Church Online. My name is Steve. We are so thankful that you tuned in to be a part of our online church family today. We have a great service planned for you. Pastor Jeff continues his message series entitled, Never a Day Without. If you'd like more information about New Hope, visit our website at www.newhopeconnect.org. So now let's come together to sing, pray, and hear from God's Word. Welcome to New Hope Church Online. book of Isaiah chapter 64 the opening verse is oh that you would rend the heavens and come down so I've got a paper bag here and what the uh, opening verse of Isaiah 64 is saying is that God is up here in heaven and there's a glory to God always uh, Isaiah chapter 6 that's where they're at that uh, Isaiah is in the throne room of God and the angels and the seraphims and always uh, back and forth, back and forth, holy, holy, holy. And every time they open up their eyes, they see a whole other facet of God's glory, holy, holy, holy. But we know that down here where we live, it's broken. And in this 2020, it is really, really broken. So the cry of Isaiah thousands of years ago was, oh, Lord, that you would rend the heavens and come down through them. And we know that that's what our God has done. He rendered the heavens and came down into this broken world. It's still broken. But we have a hope because God came down. We don't go up by our power and rip open the heavens so that we can go up there. God comes and opens up the heavens. Let's pray. Gracious God, as we enter into worship on this worship Sunday, we look to you that you would indeed rend the heavens as we're going to sing in our opening song, open up the heavens. And some of the lines that we're going to sing is your glory like a fire, awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth. And so we pray as we sing this opening song, as we have these moments to worship you today, that you will burn our hearts with your good truth. We know that this broken world, especially in this year of 2020, there's so many lies, there's so many hard things going on, but we know that there's still truth, and it's your truth. We want to hear your good truth over all the lies of this world. So Lord Jesus, as we open up our hearts to you, as you open up the heavens to us, be with us as we get to sing and worship you and hear from you. So open up the heavens. We pray it in your name. Amen. Good morning, New Hope. Please join and sing with me as we worship our great God together. We've waited for this day. We're gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire, will burn our hearts with truth. And you're the reason we're here, and you're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river. Flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Your presence in this place, your glory on our face. We're looking to the sky, descending like a cloud. You're standing with us now. Lord, unveil our eyes. You're the reason we're here. And you're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens. We want to see you. Open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart. Filling every part of our praise. Oh, open up the heavens. 
We want to see you open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Show us, show us your glory, show us, show us your power, show us Show us your glory, Lord. Sing that with me again. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Oh, open up the heavens. We want to see you open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Oh, open up the heavens, we want to see you open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart. And filling every part of our praise. Amen. the world but it couldn't fill me oh man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough then you came along and put me back together and every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Because the God of the mountains is the God of the valleys. And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again oh there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you lord there's nothing nothing is better than you turn morning to dancing you give beauty for ashes you turn shame into glory you're the only one who can you turn graves into gardens you turn bones into armies you turn seas into highways, you're the only one who can. Oh, there's nothing better than you, there's nothing better than 
you, Lord, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. So we've been thinking about hand stories, hand stories. In some ways, there's uh, just two kind of main hand stories. Oftentimes, when it comes to our hands, we uh, want to tell a story. Look, look, look at my kind of good, hard-working hands. Here's all the good, hard-working things that I do with my hands, and this is why my life is doing this and this and this, you know, why I have a home, why I have a car, why I have, you know, good clothes on, why I'm, I'm working hard, I'm working hard and, and I'm doing all these things. And the other kind of big hand story is that look at their not so good lazy hands. That's why they're poor. That's why they're suffering. That's why you fill in the blanks. Those are kind of the two big hand stories. And then when we think about those two hand stories, the big categories, here's, here's my hard, strong, uh, hard working hands, and here's someone's not good and lazy hands. We ask kind of this uh, next question is, um, whose hand story does God favor? Whose hand story does God favor? And that's kind of what we oftentimes do, but Two questions for us this morning. What if no one has good, clean hands? What if no one has good, clean hands? And, and the second question is, what happens to all hands? What happens to all hands? Again, we looked at the opening words of Isaiah chapter 64. I want us to go back to Isaiah chapter 64 and think about uh, um, verses 6 through 12. We're just going to kind of quickly go through each verse and see what it says about all hands. In Isaiah 64 verse 6, we read this. We have all become like one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind Take us away. So in this verse 6 of Isaiah 64, it gives us two metaphors. First of all, it says all the works of our hands, all of our righteous deeds, our hardworking, our good hands, all of our righteous deeds are a filthy rag. And maybe uh, you've heard this before when it comes to this verse, that when it talks about we're unclean, that our, 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 all of our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment, it oftentimes is something that it's, it's a rag and that rag is bloody. And that's the, our good, hardworking hands that we bring that God looks at it as kind of polluted rag. Like, whoa. And, and the other metaphor, and that's what we're living right now, or actually almost past it all, all the leaves from the trees have fallen uh, maybe you've raked them, maybe they've been taken away, they've been blown away. And so 
the metaphor here is that all of our works are hands that we really can't bring those things to God and say, God, look at me, look at me, look at me. They just go away. It's not that God doesn't love us and care about us. I mean, we still are, you know, we have souls that matter and we're chosen holy and dearly loved. But God is saying, don't try to bring your works of your hands to me. We're going to be looking at another hand story as we always do. Verse 7 says this, There is no one who calls upon your name who rouses himself to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have made us melt in the hand of our iniquities. Again, here's the things that even, you know, when we think that we are doing good, hardworking things. And again, don't think that what I'm talking about here, what the Bible is talking about, is that we shouldn't use our hands to do good, hardworking things. But don't think that some of our good, hardworking hands earn us favor with God. That's what this, uh, these passages in Isaiah 6, 4 is just completely against. That's a fool's, that's a fool's thinking. And so it says in this, this verse that, uh, we're, we, we don't rouse ourselves, even as we're here to worship and you're online and I'm on this side of the screen, you're on that side of the screen. That's good. But again, we're not getting credit because of our worship. We're getting credit because we have a God who keeps coming to us as only he can. In verse 8, we read this. But now, O Lord, you are our Father. Ah, oh, how we love that. We are the clay. And you are the potter, we are all the work of your hand. And we like that image, except if you ever actually watch a potter at work, there is this lump of misshaping clay, just a lump. There's nothing pretty about it, there's nothing desirable about it. And if you watch it, they, when they put it on the spinning wheel, oftentimes they take it and they kind of smack it down and, and then they uh, part putting their hand into it to, to shape it. And the hand is forceful. And Hannah's going to shape it in ways that um, God wants to shape us. And we oftentimes think, well, we want to go this way, and God wants us to go this way. And so there's that tension. But we want to be the work of God's hands. And it's going to hurt sometimes, but it's going to be the best for us. Verse 9 says this, Be not so terribly angry angry, O Lord, and remember not iniquity forever. Behold, please look. We are all your people. And Isaiah here is, is God is angry. We're, we're going to look at that in, in a, a minute. Why it is that God is so angry? Remember not. And yeah, that's a plea. And he doesn't remember, which we're very, very thankful. For. But I love that, that. Behold, please look. We are all your people. Even when we're suffering. The, the next uh, um, a couple of verses here. They're kind of hard verses, but they are true verses. Well, in verse 10, it says, Your holy cities have become a wilderness. Zion has become a wilderness. Jerusalem, a desolation. Again, when Isaiah is writing these words, the city of Jerusalem has uh, fallen or will soon fall. Uh, the northern part of Israel has already fallen, been gone for over a hundred years. Uh, the people of God have not been true to God. They've, you know, so many of them, hard-working hands, good hands, still trying to do what they're supposed to do. But so many of them also thinking, that, hey, with my good, hard-working hands, here you go, God, here you go, God, here you go, God. And it just hasn't worked out, even after God has warned them over and over again. Don't bring me your good, hard-working hands. Look at my hands, look at my hands, look at my hands. Or in verse 11, it says this, Our holy and beautiful house, where our fathers praised you, has been burned by fire, and all our pleasant places have become ruins. So Isaiah is seeing how the temple has been destroyed, the temple is burned, how so many homes throughout the city of Jerusalem have been burned. And so God... Is looking out over this desolation. Isaiah is looking out over this desolation. So there's these moments. There's still God's people. God is still writing his gospel story. God still has the hands of Jesus in operation. But in these moments, the people of God 
while their hands are not so good and not so hard working. But somehow God is still going to be with him. Or verse 12, it says this. Will you restrain yourself at these things, O Lord? Will you keep silent and afflict us so terribly? These last two questions in verse 12 kind of the answer that's actually expected, which, again, we don't think it should be the expected answer, is um, yes. Uh, God has restrained himself against all this that has happened. God has kept silent, and the affliction has happened in very terrible ways. But the story is not done yet. So in this year of 2020... um, Again, so many things, so many things. Again, we still have wonderful homes. We still have our food. We still have water. We still have great relationships with our family. Even though it's it's hard to be online, on me on this side of the screen, you on that side of the screen, now for months and months and months. And again, for so many of us, it's just not safe for us to be back together in person. So we're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting. So it's, it's really, really hard. But yet, why... Do we have to go through this? And that's kind of always the question. I mean, it's not a question just for us here in 2020. Again, thinking back to the time of Isaiah and all the things that we know about the history of the nation of Israel, God's people, God's chosen people, and now Jerusalem is wiped desolate and all the people that have suffered, the people that have died, even though there are so many of them that still had good, hardworking hands. But so many of them tried to take in what was in their hands and bring it to God saying, look, God, look, God, look, God. Be pleased with what's in my hands, even though I'm taking so much away from you. So what do we do with the anger of God? We Feel that anger this year. The Bible is, is, has so many stories with the anger of God. Well, our friends at the Bible Project, they have their brand new video. They've been doing this series now called The Character of God. And the, the, all the series, they're going to do five videos. All the series revolves around Exodus 34, 6. You know the verse. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. And so they're taking those big key words of that Bible verse and making five videos focusing on each key word or each key phrase. So here's the latest video slow to anger that just came out this last week and so it's great for us let's watch this together if you tried to describe what god is like it could be difficult or daunting but when the people who wrote the bible pondered the mystery of god they consistently describe god's character in this way compassionate and gracious slow to anger overflowing with loyal love and faithfulness we're going to look at this third phrase that god is slow to anger Now, that might surprise some people. Isn't the God of the Bible mostly angry, striking people down for their sins? Well, it turns out that God's anger in the Bible is way more nuanced than that and way more interesting. In Hebrew, the phrase slow to anger is pronounced erek apayim, or literally long of nose. But what does God's patience have to do with a long nose? Well, first, we need to look at the common biblical Hebrew way to say that someone is angry. Their nose burned hot. Like in the story of Joseph, when Potiphar thinks that Joseph tried to sleep with his wife, his nose burned hot. It's usually translated, his anger burned. It's describing how your body, especially your face, gets hot when you're filled with anger. And so in Hebrew, the main words for anger are either nose or heat or hot nose. This is why a patient person is called long of nose. It takes a long time for their nose to get hot. Like in the biblical proverb, a person's wisdom is their long nose, that is, their slow anger. Now, in the Bible, God gets angry numerous times, but God doesn't have a nose or get hot. These are metaphors using our experience of hot anger to describe how God feels when he witnesses human evil. Just like you would get angry if you saw a child being bullied on the playground, so God gets angry when humans oppress each other and ruin his world. In the Bible, God's anger is an expression of his justice and his love for the world. But he's slow to anger, which means he gives people lots of time to change. Like in the story of the Exodus, when Pharaoh enslaves the Israelites and has their baby boys thrown into the waters, God sends Moses to confront Pharaoh. 
and Pharaoh's given ten chances to let Israel go free. But after the tenth refusal, Pharaoh rides out with his chariots to destroy the Israelites, and so God destroys him in the waters. Pharaoh's own evil is turned back upon him, and we read that this is an act of God's hot anger. Now, that's really intense, but think about it. God wouldn't be good if he didn't get angry at Pharaoh's evil and eventually do something about it. And notice that God's anger is expressed by handing Pharaoh over to the consequences of his own decisions. And this is actually how God's anger is shown throughout the scriptures, like in the story of the Israelites. Over and over again, for hundreds of years, they betray the God who rescued them from slavery. And though he gives them many chances to turn around, they keep giving their allegiance to the gods of other nations. And each time we read that the hot anger of God burned against the Israelites. But notice what always follows. God gave them over into the hands of their enemies. Israel wanted to serve the gods of other nations, and so God, in his just anger, gives them what they want as those nations circle back and defeat Israel. This is similar to what the Apostle Paul says in his letter to the Romans. He says, God's anger is being revealed against human evil. And then three times he says what that looks like. God hands people over to their destructive desires and decisions, even if it leads to death. But Paul also says, God is patient, giving people time to come to their senses and change. Because remember, God's anger is a response to human evil, and it's based on a deeper character trait, his compassion and his loyal love. God is not content to let people sit in their own self-destruction. In the Bible, God's on a mission to rescue. This is why Jesus said that he was going to Jerusalem to die as a demonstration of God's love for his enemies. He would stand in the place of his people who were choosing self-destruction and take the consequences of their decisions upon himself. In Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, we see God's anger at evil and his love for people working together to provide forgiveness and life for a humanity lost in self-ruin. So God's anger in the Bible is really important, but it's not the end of the story. When God is angry and brings justice, it's because he's good. And he's extremely patient, working out his plan to restore people to his love. And that's what it means to say that God is slow to anger. So again, that's a video that you can watch over and over again. I've watched it a number of times. I'm sure I'm going to watch it a number of more times. But that whole slow to anger, uh, it's what we've been thinking about over these last number of weeks throughout this whole uh, uh, series in that on never a day without um, looking at all the things that God has done. He, there's just never a day that, with, that we're without Jesus. There's never a day that we're without taking. There's never a day without, with, with, that we're without maybe some letting go. There's never a day without our hands that we can be open and, and thankful. So uh, slow to anger. Did you like that whole aspect, the whole metaphor of hot nose? I had a Norwegian grandfather that when he got himself uh, kind of worked up and angry and that, his nostrils would actually flare. I remember that vividly as a child. When grandpa's nostrils flared, I always made sure that I was out of arms reaching that. But right at the end of the video, did you catch that? That God's anger, not the end of the story. So we keep saying this, Romans 2 verse 4, Here's the, and they quoted that in the video. The, the riches of his kindness, his tolerance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you toward repentance. God's kindness. So even when there's that anger. God, his first uh, desire, his main desire is to be for kindness, is for grace, is for patience. But eventually that anger does have to come. And rightly so, as the video was pointing out to us, rightly so. But we want to focus on his kindness. We want to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. And especially we keep fixing our eyes on the nail scarred hand. And the reason that we want to keep fixing our eyes in the nail-scarred hand of Jesus is what story do the nail-scarred hands of Jesus tell us? Well, it tell, tells us that Jesus rendered the heavens and came down into this broken world and allowed himself to be broken and allowed himself to have nails put through his hands and to take a last breath and die for the sins of the world 
and die for our hands that are not so good and not so clean. And all hands die. But because we follow and fix our eyes in the nail-scarred hands of Jesus, well, we know that he will raise our still hands after our last breath with the first breath and make our hands truly good and hardworking forever and ever in the kingdom of God. So these questions for us. What hand story will we tell? What hand story will we tell? Again, so much of the time we hear uh, people tell the story, look at the work of my hands, look at the work of my hands. And um, as I, I've told you before and uh, over and over again over a number of years now, it's really hard for me to read it, obituaries in the paper. Because oftentimes when you read obituaries in the paper, they're telling the story of their hands. Oh, they, uh, they were born here in Wisconsin. They got married. They put their hands together in marriage. They were great Packer fans. They loved going up north. They loved fishing. They loved hunting. They, 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 were, they would give the shirt off of their back. I mean, they worked hard with their hands. They talk about their hand stories, their hand stories. And oftentimes we'll hear things like, now they're in, uh, up in heaven with someone else in their hand story. You know, some grandfather, a, 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 a spouse, or some son, some, you know, just all kinds of things. Look at the story of my hands. Look at the story of my hands. But what story do you want your hands to tell? I know the story that I want my hands to tell is look at the work of Jesus' hands. That's why we want to fix our eyes on Jesus. I mean, our hands are going to have stories of working hard. Our hand, stories are going to have some stories of our hands being as good and clean as they are. But all of our hands also have stories of when they are not so good, when they are not so clean. My hands do, your hands do. And so I don't want to focus on my hand's story. I want to focus on the work of Jesus' hands. So we're coming to the end of uh, 2020 and all the hand stories of this year. Oh, my goodness. I mean, uh, in so many of us, uh, so many of you, you've been trying to use your hands as good as possible this year in all the challenges and all the struggles. And then you're, you're working hard. And sometimes our hands are so exhausted from all the hard work that we're doing. But as we come to the end of 2020, the reason that we keep thinking about the hand story, the nail-scarred hands of Jesus, because those hands have been with us. Before the pandemic began, every moment of this pandemic throughout all these months, for those of you who have tested positive, the hands of Jesus have been with you, and so, I mean, you've all gotten healing. We've had, had not had any death. Some of us know some people that have died, and oh, how that just crushes us and uh, takes the wind out of us and leaves our hands just kind of limp. And, but we know that the hands of Jesus, the nail-scarred hands, the work of his hands, they're with us, they're with us. And so as we get to the end of 2020, imagine, imagine the end of our 2020 hand stories. Again, never a day without, never a day without serving our God, serving him sometimes knowing that our hands aren't trying to earn God's favor, but our hands are serving him because of all the good gifts that he's put into our hands. And so we put our hands together and pray for other people and serve them. We put our hands together and we give together and we uh, see God do some good works as we put things into the hands of other people, whether it's our friends over in Southeast Asia, so that we can put God's word into their hands, into their hearts, into their minds, or, um, their minds, or whether it's we get, bring some food in and it gets distributed here locally, whether uh, we're, we're bringing in our offerings and so the church can continue to provide online services so that the church can do some in-person wor worship, so that the church can continue to uh, serve our school uh, families and our school children in the name of Jesus, oh, the good name of Jesus, the wonderful name of Jesus. So we're here, um, middle of November, and uh, we're coming up to Thanksgiving, not too far away, coming up to the last month of the year, and again, our conversations over and over again, oh, we cannot wait until 2020 gets over.
I want to give you a little teaser of where we're going to be going over these next number of weeks. We're going to be thinking about our hand stories and the nail-scarred hands of Jesus. And I want to give us a vision, just a little quick teaser of what's it going to look like 30 years from now with our hands in 2050, 2050, just 30 years. Again, we can go 30 years back, we can go 30 years ahead, and so we're going to be thinking about that uh, coming up. I've been thinking about it a lot, and, but I just want to give you a quick teaser that we're going to start thinking about where are our hands, where are my hands, where are your hands, where are the hands of our children, the hands of our grandchildren, where are they going to be 30 years from now? We want to imagine all of our hands being connected to the nail-scarred hands of Jesus in this year of 2020, in the year of 2050. Uh, this Bible verse, as we start coming to the end of this message, as we start preparing our hearts uh, for serving and giving to, our, to the end of this year, in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7, it says this, Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So we know that this Bible verse is talking about as we decide in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls, how can we use these hands to give good gifts to God's kingdom expanding work. So we keep looking at this uh, letting go hand. So we're coming to the end of this year. So uh, will we let go into the nail scarred hands of Jesus? When we let go into the nail-scarred hands of Jesus, it's just a better hand story. So you know that uh, um, already on TV, and I've seen the commercials, you've probably seen the commercials, um, uh, Black Friday. There's not going to be a Black Friday this year, but there is going to be Black Friday. Lots and lots of sales and discounts and that. And so Black Friday tells a hand story. One of the hand stories oftentimes that uh, we, we get so excited about when it comes to like a Black Friday sale and that could be something like this. There is a big screen TV. I mean a massive big screen TV. And it would normally retail for $2,000. But on Black Friday, you can get it for $500. And so you can get that big screen TV in your hands for $500. Or you can click with your fingers and get that big screen TV for $500. But what do Black Friday hand stories tell us? Well, they tell us that sometimes when it comes to Christmas, we can do, do Christmas with a less Jesus, more world kind of approach. But because of the nail-scarred hands of Jesus... Will we do a more Jesus, less world Christmas this year? In the promise of the Bible, the promise of Jesus, the promise of his nail-scarred hands is that we can live a more Jesus, less world Christmas. It's a better hand story. So what will our hand stories be this Christmas? I'm praying, and I know how I want to use my hands this Christmas to tell some giving hand stories some giving hand Christmas stories because of the little baby hands that are born in that manger as we celebrate in Christmas. One day, we'll remember the baby scarred hands, but most what we will remember, most of what we will remember is the nail scarred hands of that little baby that was born in the manger in Bethlehem. That's a better hand story. Let's prepare our hearts and our hands to live that story out as we get into the end of 2020. Would you pray with me? So Lord Jesus, as we put our hands together to pray to you, we're so grateful that you do move our hands to do some hard work that you use our hands to do a lot of good things for you. But help us not to try to earn with our good works, with our clean hands, favor from you. May we always realize that it is because of the favor that we have from you that we can use our hands for good works and that our hands can be clean as we serve others, as we give to you. 
So Jesus, again, you put so much in our hands and even with so many things taken out of our hands this 2020, you've still been so good to us. So help us to keep receiving the gifts that you put into our open, thankful hands and help us to let go of some of what you have been placing into our hands this 2020. Do something in our hearts that only you can do. I know that I'm not going to be able to convince you to, or I'm not going to be able to come and take it out of your hands. Jesus can move each one of us to release and to let go of some of what he has put into our hands so that his kingdom work might go on and on. So Jesus, as we put our hands together, help us to pray this giving prayer that you have given to us that we know as the Lord's Prayer. We pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So now with our hands, our hands, we're going to uh, point the direction to True North. Let's sing this awesome song together, True North, as our hands are get moved towards Jesus, our True North. All right, sing along. I will follow you into the dark, dark, dark. Become my compass, no I will not let the fears of life And sorrows of this world Dictate to me how I should feel For you I'm my true north To the curse of shame I will not walk beneath the clouds That taunt me and condemn For I will stand on solid ground The shadow of your love Forgiven, changed, a heart renamed For you I'm my true north With all my heart, 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 you are my true north. A little louder. I will follow you into the dark, dark, dark. You are my true north. Yeah, I will follow you with all my heart, heart, heart. You are my true north. Again, what a wonderful song. But there's a phrase in that song, a repeat in that song, that uh, really has to do with this whole aspect of God being slow to anger. Again, it doesn't come out in as so many words, but it's that aspect of follow him in the dark. Follow him in the dark. Why is it dark? Because at times God wants us to trust him even when it's dark. That so we're trying to grope our way in through the dark with our hands. We don't know that he's true north. He's true north. He's true north. So with our hands, Christ in us, the hope of 
glory. Thanks for watching New Hope Church Online. We hope that you enjoyed today's service. If you're looking for a church home, we'd love for you to consider New Hope Church. You're welcome here. Our address is 1850 American Drive, Nina, Wisconsin, 54956. Or you can reach us by phone or email. And be sure to visit us at www.newhopeconnect.org to learn more or to give online. Have a great week, everyone.